ready. Thanks very much for coming. Um, we're talking about face to face book. Uh, which is actually the third and the last piece of a trilogy. Trilogy that started with Google with itself, uh, which I'm still proud to say that was awarded by an honorary mention by Priya Sertronica in 2005 and by Amazon Noir. Face to Facebook is the third piece. Uh, of the trilogy is called Hacking Monopolism. Yeah, thank you. For all. Um, face to Facebook uh, is, of course, a project uh, about Facebook, uh, and um, it's really similar to the other uh, project of the trilogy. In fact, we use the data that is really relevant for uh, Facebook, uh, one of the most powerful companies in the world right now. So we downloaded from Facebook uh, one million uh, pictures. Uh, uh, more than picture public profile, so name, surname, uh, the major um, picture, image, uh, the JPEG, and a um, few other data, basically the public data that you can find uh, on Google, even on Google. Uh, these uh, from uh, 55 countries over the world, so it was really a big database uh, that we could uh, um, manage uh, to store in uh, our uh, laptop, let's say. And in the end, uh, it's ended up to be like 10 gigabyte of uh, JPEG picture. So uh, then we started to filter all this JPEG um, through a face recognition software because we, we, we look at the faces that were uh, really well recognizable because sometimes they are avatar, you know. And then uh, always with the same software, we grouped uh, this JPEG uh, between female and male uh, people because on the public data of Facebook, you don't know the gender of these people. So we had to figure out automatically and that the software uh, did. Uh, after this, um, this process, we end up to have 250,000 profiles uh, out of these 1 million. It means that these 250,000 profiles were uh, really well, um, really good picture in a way. <laughs> And, um, and then we used again another version of uh, facial uh, um, recognition software that uh, find out the expression, so the facial expression of all these people, or all of these faces. Uh, basically, we, we fed uh, the software with uh, uh, samples, uh, a sample of six categories uh, of facial expression. So we uh, just thought, okay, this person should be smug or a social climber and so on. And the software figured out, uh, um, uh, found basically the rest of the picture, categorized all these uh, uh, big database that we had. Uh, the last step after this categorization was just uh, publish everything on a dating website. Um, and so on the dating website called uh, lovelyface.com, uh, all these people were categorized by their temperament, uh, name, surname, nationality, and uh, event preference. Uh, um, it was really a well-organized uh, um, database on uh, this uh, uh, frame uh, dating website, so everyone could find a potential partner, just say uh, um, easygoing uh, Austriac girl that like uh, cinema, blockbuster cinema, let's say. And you actually, you could find some girl like that and you could uh, arrange a dating uh, by clicking on, uh, on the contact button and then uh, ended up in the homepage, Facebook homepage, and so closing the circuit, the circle, and actually to contact the real person. Okay, how we uh, start this? We started also with a bunch of theoretical considerations. Generally speaking about social network and, of course, about Facebook. Social networking, we think it's naturally addictive. 
It's about exploring something very familiar that has never been available before. Staying in touch with the past and present friends and acquaintances in a single, potentially infinite, virtual space. This phenomenon challenges us psychologically, creating situations that previously were not possible. Before the rise of social networking, former friends and acquaintances would tend to drift away from us and potentially become consigned to our personal histories. Having a virtual space with reactive people constantly updating their activities in the basic powerful fascination of the social network, there's another attraction based on the elusive sport or perhaps urge to position ourselves. An intimate involvement and endless questioning of our own identity, often literally juxtaposing our physical one, is perpetrated in the social network game. But social network platforms are not public organization designed to help support social problems, but private corporations, of course. Their mission is not to help people create better social relationships or to help them to improve their self-positioning. Of course, the only mission is to make money. Economic success for these corporations rests on convincing users to connect to the several hundred people who await them online. The market value of these companies is proportional to the number of users they have. Facebook is valued, for example, at around $50 billion and it sports 750 million users spread around the world. The game can often, can often translate into a form of social being in which the number of friends a user has is never enough to satisfy. But what kind of space is Facebook? Facebook is not home. It is way larger and more crowded. And it's not the street, because you are supposed to know everybody in your space. Facebook is an eternal, illusory party, under surveillance and recorded for all the time. Its structure invites you to first replicate and then enhance your real social structures, replicating your experiences on your own personal screen space. But let's see how we uh, represent it as an installation face to Facebook. Yeah, this uh, project um, became really not complex, but at as many layer, um, many layer. This was the theory. Uh, so on the web, on the website, you can find a long text that was just a part of the theory. Then we have uh, the um, the installation that actually is uh, here as well. And uh, in this installation, we have uh, mainly um, a selection of the picture of these 250,000 pictures. So they are like three. 3,000 picture on, a, on three panels uh, uh, grouped by, um, by facial expression. But the most interesting part is that actually uh, it became a kind of performance. Uh, and this performance started uh, from the first day of the publication of this project that was in Transmediale Festival in Berlin this winter on the 2nd of February. And uh, as soon as we sent uh, off the, um, the press release of this project, uh, uh, mainly on the opening of the festival, uh, the performance started. Uh, that's because uh, the media reacted really quickly. So the news um, spread through uh, the networks, the media network, I mean, newspaper, blog, Twitter, Facebook as well, all over the world. Um, and in a few hours, we could already count um, many, many press coverage, and, uh, and not only. That is an example that, um, that explained what was going on just the day after of the publication of the project. 
Okay, this is a video that only uh, three days later than it was public in uh, Transmediale was, uh, we, we found it online. The media has dubbed them hacktivists. Two artists from Italy stole a million names, photos, and locations from Facebook profiles. They chose their favorites and created lovelyfaces.com, a fake online dating site complete with 250,000 singles who didn't even know they were looking for love. The reason, according to the hackers, to prove a point about the social network's privacy settings. Facebook, an endlessly cool place for so many people, becomes at the same time a gold mine for identity theft and dating, unfortunately, without the user's control. This is the final project in the three-part series Paolo Sirio and Alessandro Ludovico have been working on. Each one is focused on a different internet powerhouse, Google, Amazon, and now Facebook. Using face recognition software, they were able to sort the profiles by gender, nationality, and even personality. But they say they don't have any plans for monetary gain. Not surprisingly, Facebook is not happy. Barry Schnitt, Facebook's director of policy communications, told Wired this breaks Facebook's terms of service, and the hacking duo could end up in court. We have taken and will continue to take aggressive legal action against organizations that violate these terms. We're investigating this site and will take appropriate action. But according to allfacebook.com, it might not be that easy. While those rules enable Facebook to successfully pursue violators in U.S. court, getting a lawsuit going outside of the country can be tricky. TG Daily points out, this whole thing sounds very similar to Mark Zuckerberg's face mash. It's kind of ironic because as anyone who's seen the social network could tell you, the entire concept of Facebook began when Mark Zuckerberg stole personal data about students that was stored on university databases. But Digital Trends Jeffrey Van Camp asks, did these hackers really think they could take on Facebook? He says it was a sad attempt. If this is some grand plan to destroy Facebook, Sirio and Ludovico may be more delusional than the millions who believe Facebook is a secure, private place to chat with their friends. For much of the day Friday, the Lovely Faces website came up with an error message reading, Sorry, the website will not work. You should try again. For Newsy.com, I'm Christina Hartman. Multiple the, sources, The reason the why story. the dating website was not working at that time is because it was flooded by requests of people trying to see if they were inside the dating website. So we had like a million of people looking at the same time, so the server collapsed, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and and a, a friend, luckily enough, helped us to make a little trick to make it online again, but the, the viral uh, news about face to Facebook started to spread uh, in a very in incredible way for us. We really didn 't expect something like that. We collected uh, this is the list uh, uh, today um, we have one uh, one thousand one hundred different uh, reactions from various media. you can imagine of course also from uh, um, Austrian media. Uh, this specific one found out that on the dating website there was also Andreas Molzer, which is, uh, we learned, is uh, uh, um, a politician in Austria, but we have anything from uh, uh, the press to or Globo to Vanguardia, reactions all over the world, even famous like the Chronicle, uh, Le Nouvel Observateur, and even, and this is um, uh, The Age, one of the major newspapers in Australia, who made a poll, which was, should lovelyfaces.com require consent to use your photo? And uh, I don't have the screenshot here, but 9,700 people replied. You can guess the percentage, and 97% said no. But 3%, uh, I mean, 3% said yes. They can use my photo. The thing is that this press reaction was incredible on two different levels. One was the media one, and one was the personal one. What I mean is that um, all this press reaction, we started to think about why it went so viral. And we thought that we were able to package, in a way, a kind of perfect news. It was perfect news because it was about Facebook, so involving potentially 750 million users. And it was about the danger uh, concerning to Facebook. So everybody could have been uh, interested and involved. That's probably why the news spread virally. But of course, online, there was another level, which was the personal communication. Uh, during Transmedial, we passed our time in front of the screen, just reloading Google News tracking and Twitter. And we had an average of one new tweet 
about lovely faces every two minutes, saying, hey, friends, check this out and see if you are there. Okay, we will go back about personal reaction in a while, but of course, uh, uh, media and uh, uh, singular individuals were not the only one reacting to the project. Yeah, that, uh, that was part of the performance in a week. Uh, uh, we had uh, this 1,000 uh, press coverage, so it was really quick. And after uh, two days, basically, we also received the first letter from the Facebook's lawyers. That is a cease and desist letter, of course. Uh, I mean, it was just the beginning of the troubles, actually, I would say. Uh, in this letter that we received uh, by email, but actually was with our um, home address in Italy, we still don't know how they found them. But uh, anyway, they <clears throat> asked, of course, to stop uh, immediately the dating website and never do again what we did. We ask, they asked to delete all the data that uh, we stole and uh, giving back all this data too because it's owned by them apparently, allegedly. And uh, then they should off, they shoot um, down our account because we used to have uh, Facebook as well. And so we are banned, so we are not allowed to use Facebook, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, we are banned forever. Forever. <laughs> and yeah, and that was the first uh, letter that we had. Um, so we waited a couple of days more because fortunately enough, we received this letter on Friday evening. And you know, because of the weekend, we thought, okay, they are out of the office, and so we can go a little bit, a little bit farther. So we, we kept the, the, the dating website like three days more online. That was even, anyway, really intense, and uh, Alessandro will explain why. Uh, this uh, legal uh, situation uh, is still going on. Actually, just today, uh, we sent to them another letter um, to this uh, lawyer um, of Facebook uh, because uh, we got also another lawyer that defends us. We found uh, this lawyer that worked uh, under the pro bono program uh, through the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and we are still out of the court, so it's not a proper lawsuit. We just exchange letter, and they say uh, they say that we violate the security, and uh, they they quote always some uh, American law. And uh, our our um, our lawyer, and what also we say is that we actually didn't hack properly Facebook because that was public data. We didn't use even our profile to scrape this data, and uh, we didn't uh, force any kind of uh, protection of them. Actually, all this data has been downloaded uh, uh, two years ago when Facebook was really uh, without any protection. Now it's quite impossible to do the same, but at that time it was really easy. So anyway, it's a long process, uh, process of uh, exchange of email and call between these two lawyers, but we still are free, and uh, we still have all this data. We didn't delete that. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't give back to them anything. Um, but not, 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 that was not enough. There is also, it must be said that uh, actually they also asked to shoot down uh, the project at all. I mean, the, the website that explained uh, uh, what we did, uh, the theory, uh, the diagram, even the installation. They don't want that we, we show the installation. They don't want that we talk about it even now. And uh, we also received uh, another, um, another email from another legal department of Facebook uh, asking um, to not use Facebook uh, in the domain name of our website because the, the word Facebook is uh, trademarked by them. So it's really hard, and they are really, really aggressive. But we still are here, so. Yeah, we, we can still tell you the story, yeah. Um, yeah, and indeed, we are very, very happy of this prize, also because then maybe the Facebook lawyers should start to consider 
uh, the hypothesis that this is a work of art, as we are claiming since the beginning, but they don't trust us. Maybe, maybe they will trust uh, Ars Electronica better than us. Okay, um, we were talking about personal reactions, which were as intense as the media one, and we had a form on the dating website um, for communicating with us. And uh, we, of course, we were rough treating people like that. I mean, not asking uh, anybody permission to do what we did, but it was, as you can imagine, necessary. But we clearly stated, uh, if you want to be off this website, just send us a mail, and we will do it. And I personally spent a couple of weeks uh, delaying people who asked to be off the website. Of course, that wasn't really enough, so we received a very um, um, various kind of email from the protests like shame on you, thief, uh, to uh, people who started to connect things in a very creative way, like this uh, um, lady or girl, I don't know, who said, please take me down immediately. I'm getting creepy phone calls from a blocked number that saw my profile on a single site. Of course, uh, luckily enough, we weren't involved. As uh, fake emails from Interpol, this guy registered this interpol.com, which is uh, quite an ambiguous interpol, and um, he wrote us a thing like, so you saw the identities of 250,000 people, greedy fucks. <laughs> okay, I, can, I don't want to be uh, too cursed, but ca you can imagine uh, uh, this was even more angry. You can read it on the screen. I don't want to continue to be more cursed than that, but there were, there were, there, there were people who wanted to be on the website, or they, they were very happy about our action. Uh, for example, there's this uh, um, founder of Moby Digger, mobile privacy company, who was proposing us a potential partnership. We are talking about a commercial partnership for using the software. Or this other guy wanted to suggest some Facebook profiles to us to be included in the dating website. Kind of sweet revenge for somebody, maybe. Or other people, and I can tell you there were not just two or three, who wanted to be, as I said, in the website. Can you add my profile in your site? Uh, they were, these were the kinds of press reaction. We even had uh, five different death threats, and you can imagine, I mean, uh, how many... Uh, personal reaction, yeah, this is a kind of another chapter of the story. Uh, but I would like to, uh, we would like to end with a few more consideration, general uh, considerations about the action, about how Facebook works, because um, Facebook offer what can be termed as crowdsourced targeting. The indirect identification of people's targets and desires by the users themselves. In fact, the spontaneously posted data provi provides an endless, almost automatic, mutual profiling, enriching and updating the single virtual identities in a collective self-positioning. But can profile data be liberated from Facebook's inexorable logic? The answer, in our opinion, is yes. But it's important to focus on the core of the Facebook profiles and see how they are recognized as virtual identities. First, the profiles sublimate the owner's real social actions and references through their virtual presences. Second, they synthesize their effectiveness in representing real people through a specific element, the profile picture. This picture, an important Facebook interface, more often than not shows a face, and a smiling one at that. Our face is our most private space, and simultaneously the most exposed one. How many people are allowed to touch our face, for example? And generally speaking, the face is also one of the major points of reference we have in the world. The resulting scenario is that the different elements forming the identities can be remixed, recontextualized, and reused at will. Facebook data becomes letters of an unauthorized alphabet to be used to narrate real identities or new identities, forming new characters as a new background. 
And this is potentially open process that anybody can undertake. It becomes more tempting when we realize the vast amount of people who are smiling. When we smile in our profile picture, we are truly smiling on everyone on Facebook. So any user can easily duplicate any personal picture on his or her hard disk and then upload it somewhere else with different data. The final step is to be aware that almost everything posts online can have a different life if simply recontextualized. If we start to play with the concepts of identity, of, sorry, of identity theft and dating, we should be able to unveil how fragile a virtual identity given to a, pro given to a proprietary platform can be, and how fragile enormous capitalization based on exploding social system can be and it, it will eventually mutate from a plausible translation of real identities into virtual management or something just for fun, with no assumed guarantee of trust, crumbling the whole market evaluation hysteria that surrounds the crowded and much-hyped online social platforms. Thank you very much.